All right, hopefully by now you've already watched one of my previous videos on how to set up your own dedicated Rust server on your local network. If you haven't yet, of course, go back to my channel and check out one of these videos right here. But as promised in my latest Rust server setup video, I told you that I was gonna show you how to add Oxide to your Rust server so that you can start modding and adding plugins to your server. And while that process is incredibly simple, there are a couple of important details that you have to make a note of. Hey everybody, welcome back to Rust Admin Academy where I'm teaching you everything that you need to know about owning and operating a successful Rust server. On this channel, I do plugin reviews and tutorials, plus I wanna give you all of the little tips and tricks to help you be more successful. If you wanna help me become more successful, of course, all you need to do is like this video and make sure that you've subscribed to the channel and turn on notification bells so that you get notified every time I upload a new video. And of course, if you wanna take your support even further, you can become a YouTube channel member by clicking the join button down below or by joining my Patreon at patreon.srtbull.com. All right, so the first thing that we need to do is obviously shut down the server because we don't wanna do any of this work with the server running. But just to show you that I don't currently have Oxide installed on this server, I'm gonna do an o.version in console and it says the command is not found, which means Oxide is not present. The next thing we need to do is we need to head over to umod.org and grab the latest version of Oxide. I'll put a link to that in the video description down below. Just simply click on the download button right here and let it download into your downloads folder. Once it's finished downloading, you're gonna notice that it comes to you in the form of a zipped folder. We're gonna simply unzip that folder. We're then left with an oxide.rust folder and we can delete the zip folder. So I've got my downloads folder on the left-hand side of the screen and I've got my server folder on the right-hand side of the screen. If we go into the oxide.rust folder, you're gonna find a rust dedicated underscore data folder. And that's the folder that we're gonna transfer over into our server folder to install oxide. And it's a really simple process. We can just drag and drop it directly from our downloads folder into the blank area of our server folder. It's gonna ask you if you wanna replace the 11 files, 11 or so files with the same names. And yes, of course we do. It's also worth noting that once you've done this process on your server once already, and then you go to update Oxide later, that number is gonna be vastly different. I think it's closer to 30 files that it's gonna overwrite. Okay, hang on. Before you get all excited and you wanna boot up your server with Oxide on it, we have to make some changes to our batch file before we can do that. So if you followed along on the previous video on how to set up your Rust server, your batch file should look very similar to this one but I imagine, of course, you've changed a couple of the locations, which is totally fine. The line that I wanna bring your attention to is line number three, if you followed along exactly. So what we wanna do is we wanna highlight that line and actually remove it from this batch file altogether. So I can just copy it to the clipboard and delete it or cut it, whatever you wanna do, but you have it on your clipboard first. And then we're gonna go create a new file and we're gonna pasta that line in just by itself on a brand new file. And I want you to save this file as updater.bat. And we can save it in the same location that our Rust server starter file is, it's totally fine. And now with that line removed from our original batch file, we can of course go ahead and start our server up. The reason why you have to take that line out is the way I have that batch file set up, is it will automatically check with Steam to see if there's an update to Rust every time you boot that server up. So what that's gonna do, if you have Oxide installed on your server, is it's actually gonna overwrite Oxide and put the server completely back to vanilla. Now don't panic or anything, because if you've done any kind of work on your plugins or your configuration files within your Oxide folder, all that information is still gonna be there, but the modding platform Oxide will no longer exist. So all of that work that you've done, while it still exists, won't actually work. So by taking that line out, we're now making it so that the server will no longer check with Steam to check for an update, and it'll just go ahead and boot the server like normal. However, because we've moved that line into a separate file, anytime we do need to update that server, we can just run the updater.bat, and it'll check with Steam, it'll run the update, and then of course you would go ahead and install Oxide again on top of that. So the general rule of thumb is this, anytime Facepunch puts out an update to the game, the gents over at Oxide will also put an update for Oxide out. So like I said before, now that we've done all that stuff, we of course could boot our server up. However, I'm gonna show you something that I do in my batch file just to make life a little bit simpler, or in some cases, maybe a little bit more difficult, depending on how you look at it. So first of all, the one thing that I really don't like about batch files is that it doesn't fit on one page and it doesn't read very easily. So what I like to do is I actually like to break up the batch file and put each individual command on its own line or basically. So when I'm done with it, this is what my batch file looks like as a final product. So you'll notice I've added this caret at the end of each line. This tells Windows to basically stop looking for more information on this line and go down to the next line and read that command. But a really important detail here is that you have no spaces or what I like to call ghost spaces 
after any one of these carrots. So for example, on this line right here, server.query port 28017, I've got a space right here, and then I've got a carrot right there. So if I accidentally put a space after this carrot right here, this batch file is going to stop working right there. So anything after that is just going to be ignored. So I'm going to actually show you what happens because it's important that you can very quickly recognize what your server looks like if you've added a ghost space somewhere on your batch file. Okay, so once the server finally boots up, there's so many different things here that I'm seeing that tells me that there's something wrong. First of all, I have a player count of zero of 500. Well, why would I have a player count of 500 on my server? I wouldn't. Plus my server host name isn't what I called it in my batch file. In my batch file, it's called SRT Bull YouTube Test Server 2024. Higher up here, you'd also notice that it didn't load the right map and it didn't load the right seed. But in order to check that, we can type server.seed and it'll tell us what seed it loaded. 1337 is not the seed that I used. If you want to check the world size, it's going to say 4500. I did not select 4500. So I know that there's something wrong. So let's go back to the batch file and of course remove that ghost space that I know that I put in there to show you what happens. Make sure we save that batch file. Now when I boot this server up, it's gonna load up everything correctly right down to the very end because I know that I don't have any ghost spaces anywhere. But before I do that, I'd like to show you one more thing that I like to do on servers that I'm running Oxide on. I like to add this line right here called Oxide.directory. This makes it so that we can specify where the Oxide files are going to go. So where the plugins are gonna live, where all the configuration files are going to live where everything oxide related is going to live if you don't put that cvar in there it's just going to show up right here and this oxide folder is now going to affect or modify any of the additional servers that we might want to run out of this same instance of rust dedicated.exe so a lot of times what people will do is they'll have a 2x a 5x a 10x or 50x they'll have multiple different servers that all run out of the same instance which you can do but in order for your plugins to work separately from each other you have to have that oxide.directory so that you can have different variations of different plugins for each individual server all running out of the same instance. So for this example here, let's go into the server folder and this is my 2024 test server right here. So this is the location that we want. So let's actually grab this location off the top bar here, which yes, you can see that and take that location back to our batch file. So we're actually going to add that in right here, just like so like that. And we also want to make sure that we added the carrot at the end of this line as well as made sure that there's no ghost space after it. I almost forgot to put oxide at the end of that and that would have really messed that up right there. So put in your location where you want it to go and then add the oxide at the end of it. Make sure you save that. And now when I boot up this server, you're gonna see something happen inside that server folder. In fact, I'll just get it going here right now so that you can actually, maybe you'll see it happening. So as the server boots up, it's going to tell oxide where these files are gonna be and it's gonna create that folder there. It just happened literally as I was saying that. So if we go into that folder called oxide, this is where we can install our plugin deal with all of our configuration files, et cetera, et cetera. And like I said before, the reason why I do that is because if you're going to have multiple different servers running out of this same instance, you can have different plugins with different configuration files all running within this same instance of Rust. So is it likely that you're going to do that on your own local network? No, probably not. Because most people won't be setting up these dedicated servers on their local network to actually be out there in the public world. Now, if you want to be doing this just to be setting up servers and then transferring all of that information into a hosted server, this is a really great way of doing that. You can do all of your plugin configurations and all of your setup on your local network before you launch it on a publicly available server. Can you host from your local network? Yes, of course you can. I just, I don't don't feel that it's worth the resources that it's going to cost you to do that as opposed to having it on a hosted site, something like icedhost.com. Okay, so now you're going to notice that because I fixed that ghost space, my player counter is right, my server host name is right, basically everything is right because I knew that it would be. Before I let you go, I want to show you another really important aspect about Oxide. So let's go into the server folder because this is where we told our Oxide files to go. And let's go into the Oxide folder. This Oxide.config.json, this is a very important Important file that you need to know it exists and what you can and probably should do. I don't know why I have my notepad plus plus on not dark mode. I never have it on not dark mode. That's super weird. Anyway, so this is what our oxide configuration file looks like. This right here is probably the most important line that I want everybody to know about. So it says modded and it's toggled to true. What this is going to do is remove your server from the community list on Rust and add it to the modded list on Rust. So let me give you a piece of advice. 
If you're going to have any plugins on your server whatsoever that modify gameplay, you have to leave this set to true. If the only plugins that you're going to be using on your server are 100% strictly admin use only, then you can change this back to false, save this and reboot your server. And it's going to move your server from the modded list back into the community list. However, here's your warning. If you get caught using game changing plugins on your server and you exist on the community tab, you run the risk of being blacklisted from face punch. Now, could that affect your Steam ID? I don't know. Could that affect your relationship with face punch going forward? I don't know. I just know that it's not worth it to find out. So use this toggle carefully. If you're unsure, just leave it set to true. That'll put you on the modded list and that's fine. There's nothing wrong with being on the modded list. But if you're confident that the plugins that you're using on your server are 100% admin use only, then you can switch that back to false and feel pretty good about being on the community list. Another thing that I like to do is I actually like to turn plugin watchers off or set it to false so that when I install a plugin into the plugins folder, it doesn't automatically compile. Sometimes I don't want it to. And then you just have to manually reload the plugin in order for the plugin to actually load. I don't know if this is true so much anymore, but it used to be that sometimes when you were installing a plugin with plugin watchers turned on, it would actually lock up your server. I haven't checked for that in a really long time, so I don't know if that's the case anymore. But if you're finding that that happens to you, go in and turn plugin watchers to false and just manually reload your plugins and you'll stop that freeze up problem from happening. Happening. Okay, I think that's about all I can tell you about installing Oxide, some of the things to look for, some of the tips and tricks that I use on a daily basis. This is what my batch file looks like when I'm actually going into an actual production server. I think this looks a lot better. Let me know what you guys think in the comments down below. I just think this is a lot easier to read. The updater batch file that we've now created, I don't do it on that one. I don't know why. Probably because you're technically really only using that after you wipe your map anyways. All right, so like I said at the beginning the video this is a follow-up to my initial how to set up a rust server video again if you haven't seen that make sure you go back and check out one of those videos i think i have four or five of them on my channel they all pretty much go over the same thing but as you can see my progression through time the videos get better and better and i'm going to quit yammering on because i could talk about this stuff all day thank you all so much for watching and i'll see you next week